This video is sponsored by NVIDIA. Welcome back to my channel. For the past 30 days, I have had full creative freedom. I have just made whatever I want on my computer every day for 30 days. The final video has been posted to YouTube. Uh, it's currently unlisted when I'm recording this, but it will be live when you're watching this video. So you can check it out, link in the description. It is a four minute video, which is basically pure CG animation. I don't think there's a, a single frame of real footage in here. So what you're currently watching is a breakdown video. I'm going to show you everything that I have done and everything that I made, all the software I've used, all the plugins I've used, all the plants and trees and textures, everything. And I have also got my computer, which is sponsored by NVIDIA. So they made this entire project possible because I reached out to them and I said, hey guys, I'm gonna need some really powerful render power hardware. <laughs> and I got really happy when they said, yes, we would like to sponsor you. So they got me the RTX 4090, it's insane. The most powerful computer I've ever had. It's not even close. It's it's so powerful. It's ridiculous. So for this breakdown video, I have divided this up to nine scenes. We got an explosion. We got a robot. We got some insane cloth simulation. We got some smoke simulation with a character. We got a screen, like a super close up render of a screen. And we got a um, keyboard simulation with like 31,000 rigid body objects. And we got a 400 gigabyte smoke simulation. And we got this, which is some interesting materials that uses some transparency and some insane amount of light bounces. And we got this one, which is the longest render I've ever done in my life. I think it took 3.7 days, even with this insane computer. So yeah, big thanks to NVIDIA for sponsoring me with the RTX 4090, because this render would not have been possible without it. It's like, it would have taken literally weeks on my old computer. Let's have a look at the first one, which is the explosion. This animation is my first animation that I did with Embergen, which is a proprietary real-time smoke simulation software. Let's have a look. Here you can see, this is playing in real time. This is, <laughs> it just opens and plays right away. I'm not uh, super used to Embergen yet. I have some thoughts about it. I'm not really sure if I'm willing to do a review. Anyways, if you want to recreate this explosion that I made, what I did was that I used some of these uh, presets. There are a lot of presets here. This one, smoke shockwave. Here you can see it's already quite similar already. But then I tweaked some settings. I gave it some fire. I can't really remember what settings I tweaked, but here you can see there are some uh, other nodes. And I've also increased the resolution. And then I took this explosion and I used the export VDB and I exported it into Blender. So now let's open the Blender project file. Let's go to render view right away. You can't really see the logo because I've used a shader to make it invisible. So this empty object will control emission of this material. Here you can see the node setup if you want to take a screenshot. This object here is the empty object. And here you can see you got the ring explosion object, which I've imported using shift A, volume, import open VDB. And then here you can see you got uh, the sequence here. And now we can scrub on the timeline and it will be, see this is reading from like some disk I have. I got it on an external SSD, but it's still quite fast. So what I did is I added a material to this. Here you can see is my fire material. I can recommend checking out my fire simulation tutorial or smoke simulation tutorial. You'll learn how to make a much more advanced fire shader than this. And what's really important when you export from Embergen is that you enable fuel, flames and velocity, I think. If you enable this and then you export it into Blender, now you can access these in this panel over here and it crashed. So here you can see you got the density, flames, and the velocity, not really useful because the motion blur on smoke simulation in Blender is still super slow. It's so slow, it's insane. Let me just try and do some changes. So for example, we can change the color of the smoke. So you can have a blue smoke and it can be much brighter if you want to. So it's really easy to change and it's a really, really cool workflow where you can just export a VDB sequence right into Blender. I mean, I do wish Embergen was just a plugin for Blender, but that would need a GPL license. I mean, I'm pretty sure they're not gonna release Embergen under GPL. So that was shot number one, the explosion. Now let's have a look at the next shot. His hard drive legs walking on the grass. So let's open it and have a look at what it looks like inside of Blender. So here you can see we start out far, far away, and then we zoom in, and then we're here. 
So this camera motion took like probably a day to dial in. It was really difficult to get that smooth transition going. So this model or this robot is made out of parts that I have purchased on TurboSquid. I initially used this design in another video, this one. Here you can see it's the same design, but uh, I've replaced the GPU from the 3090 to the 4090 and I've also replaced some of the components. So now this is more similar to the PC I have here. All I had to do was to change the mocap because I already had used the same rig. I just had to change the animation data. So I just replaced the mocap animation, which was super tricky. And I'm not really sure if there's any reliable way to do that. I had to struggle for a little bit. So now let's have a look at this. Oh, by the way, there's an Nvidia logo there, but that didn't end up in the final shot. So let's look at this in render view. We're not getting any plants because I've disabled them because that will go really slow. Yeah, it's levitating because the grass is so long. So let's try and enable the grass and see what it looks like. So I have been using Botanic for many of the scenes in this art film project. So this is one of the shots where I tried to see how much grass can I put in this scene before I run out of VRAM. And the answer is I wasn't able to run out of VRAM. <laughs> Let's do a render actually and see how much VRAM we're using. Loading in all these flowers, curves and mesh and all these objects. I got a bunch of collections here with all the computer parts. Oh, we're actually just using 2.7 gigabytes of VRAM. So it's definitely uh, room for more grass there. I think also the botanic add-on is quite lightweight, so that's really nice. Let's try and enable some grass. Look at this, we're on the walls as well. So now we might get some uh, interesting viewport performance there. It's still fairly responsive. There's a lot of volumetrics here. Probably I would have dialed it down if I were to do this again, but I just really liked what happens. Let me show you what happens when we advanced through the timeline here, the lighting changes. I think there's a sky HDRI. This, uh, yeah, it's this one, the sky texture. I'm using a mix node to swap between these two sky textures. So there is a transition from like day, like this, to like really early morning. And I just really wanted to see that transition. The transition itself is not as smooth as I wanted it to be. Here you can see we're at the daylight and then it sort of like Bam, it's early morning. But I, I think it sort of works. And this is a lighting that I further explored in the last shot. So that is going to be shot number nine. So yeah, oh, one more thing. The golf club is, let me just hide some of this. The golf club is attached using some weird, I think there's at least one track to constraint here. There's an auto track with an animated influence. And there's also some rotoscoping here, as you can see. So making this golf club sort of work well, it took a lot of work, <laughs> but I'm really happy about this shot, especially with the sound design. It feels very, very much um, alive. Oh, that's a sneak peek on the next one. But let's have a look at the cloth simulation. So with the sound design, I just really love how this sort of explodes into this slow motion shot. And then you got this oval bokeh with the, some chromatic aberration. I wanted to make this look super warm and I wasn't really able to get it to be that warm, this glowing part. I think actually it's just some basic node setup, just some basic fog glow and just some really bright, bright lights. So this is the biggest cloth sim I've ever done. It is six gigabytes, <laughs> that is wild. So I'm not really sure how how responsive this blend file is going to be to work with, if it's going to open at all. Oh, there is. Yeah, so this is a cloth simulation. This was one of the first scenes I did, so I can't really remember the settings. So it's all gray now because it's baked, but uh, the trick is to just turn off the gravity. I just disable gravity. And then, honestly, I feel like turning off gravity is almost cheating when it comes to cloth simulation because it just looks so good in like slow motion. And yeah, so let me look at this. I just feel like this looks so good. And then there's a camera cut to a close up. And then there's a golf ball, which opens up and turns into this uh, spaceship. So I didn't use any references for the entire art film project. I just wanted to see what would come out of my brain if I just threw hours at this project, just work hours, what happens. So this design is probably a little bit inspired by Star Wars. I would think it's some combination of a TIE fighter or like this 
the evil Darth Vader vehicle, which he drives around in, and also the planet in the, I think it's Star Wars 8, where it sort of harvests the energy of the sun, of the planet. And I tried to recreate that from memory in this smaller form factor. And then we get to the end. Here you can see, you got this um, little line. So if we go to this frame, here you can see this beam here is is essentially just, um, just a curve <laughs> that just shows up. And then it just follows it when it goes away. Oh, and by the way, the texture of this cloth is exactly the same as this. So I just took a... I rendered a still frame from the last frame of this shot, saved this as an EXR, I think, and then it's just the same texture with this exactly the same mapping. So that made this sort of trippy animation where we were never leaving. Now for something really cool, the smoke simulation guy. I've been working with this smoke simulation character for a few years and it was really cool to visit him again. And this was also made with Embergen. So this also simulates almost in real time. I added some wind that comes from this direction so we could more clearly see the, the shape of this creature or this person. If the wind wasn't there, it just went straight down. It was pretty difficult to see that there was a person standing there. Yeah, oh look at this. Look at how beautiful it is where this smoke just sort of curls around like that. That is amazing, look at that. Same procedure here as in the other one. I exported the VDB sequence into Blender. So this smoke simulation was 79 gigabytes. This vibe, I just think it's so cool. And you can probably tell because I've been doing this for many renders <laughs> where I got this Voronoi texture on the ground and I got this smoke which is just landing on the ground. It's this puffy smoke that just sort of collides with the ground. I really like this effect. And here you can also see a little bit this these curly lines that we saw earlier. But I just really like how Cycles render smoke. It just looks really good. And you can just keep increasing the density. And honestly, I just think it looks better and better. Look at this. Look at this really thick smoke. It's just so detailed, I love it. And then it's super easy to change the color. So here you have this gradient from, yeah, really powerful stuff. So if you think it's annoying that it's sort of flickering like this, you can enable the viewport denoiser and you can set it to optics. And this responsive viewport with the optics denoiser is possible thanks to the NVIDIA GPU. Okay, next shot is the CRT screen. Let's have a look at it. So this is like this super macro shot of a CRT screen. I wanted to make that. And I tried to find a good CRT shader, but I wasn't really able to. I'm gonna show you later what the solution ended up being. But what we're looking at here is just a really close up image of an actual computer monitor model. And then some screen captured video that is just placed below a screen shader texture. So for this texture, I used one of the Windows 95 simulators or emulators online, there are a lot of them. And then I added this image texture as the background of this CRT texture made by my friend Victor. So I reached out to him and I said, hey man, can you make a CRT texture? That looks really good up close. Look at this. You can go super close and it looks really cool. So he made this super comprehensive nose setup and he even made this uh, texture on top of the texture. So this glass, so you can see here. Now I'm watching this in the viewport without any depth of field but it's still getting blurry over here. It's like a glass texture, I think, with some roughness, which I just think looks really cool. So this just ended up looking like a super realistic monitor display, if you ask me. And you can see how it just feels really interesting. I also added some film grain in post. In my opinion, this is the most realistic shot. This one. This feels like the most realistic shot of the film. Something about the, the screen, the fall off, the subtle blurriness and the like the depth of field and the screen monitor and then this really bright lamp model I think this lamp model is from Polyhaven and then there's this uh, computer model and then there are these keycaps which I have added a subsurface scattering material to 
So it looks like this. You don't need this one. And this was made by someone on Sketchfab. It's Creative Commons. There's a link in the description for um, all the Creative Commons assets used. So that is the close-ups of the CRT screen. Now let's have a look at the biggest rigid body simulation I've ever done. This took like hours and hours to bake. I'm not really sure how many hours it took to bake, but it was a really long time. And it took really long time to render as well, because every frame you have to build the scene again. So you have to load, I think it's 31,000 computer keys. 31,000 of those have to be loaded in to the VRAM every time. So it, it's like this constant traffic of data going into the VRAM. And then it's a close up of a mouse just moving these things around, which was uh, fun to do. This was another shot, by the way. Let's open up the big rigid body simulation and see what it looks like inside of Blender. So this takes a lot of time to open, <laughs> which is uh, expected. This is a really big file. It is 1.3 gigabytes. So it was really fun to set this scene up. But once I realized I'm going to need a lot more keys to be able to write what I want to write, I just, it was really, it was a struggle. So this was made by using a curve. So let me just show you in another project file how easy it is to. So you make a curve and a bezier and you press tab to go to edit mode, X to delete the vertices and then shift space and just draw. So now you can view this from the top and you can just write something, hello. And now you have a curve and then you can add an object and set it to follow path. And then you set it to be the curve. And then you can just sit follow curve and then it will follow the curve, right? So that's essentially what I did, but here you can see that the writing sometimes stops. It sort of stops with, the, oh, you can't see it because of my stupid face. So here you can see it stops at the S and then it starts going at the E again. So it's it's this space, right? So how do you how do you disable that rigid body simulation? And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to figure out how to disable the interaction with the emitter or the object that is moving around. But then I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have to do that. You can just draw a curve that just <laughs> it just goes down below every time instead. So it's it's quite logical actually. It's just moving on top of this and then it just goes below. Look at that. So pay attention to this little guy. Now you can see it starts under and then it's moving on top of the simulation and then it just goes below the surface like this and then it pops up again over here. So then it keeps on riding over here. So that's I felt so clever when I figured this out <laughs> because I was trying to disable the interaction of this rigid body object. But the problem is, if you're just having it turn on right next to a cube, it will often intersect and it will just blow everything away. So it was much better to just make it go up and down. Oh yeah, let me actually try and show you how long it takes to render one frame of this. Here you have one close-up image. I'm gonna press F12 and pay attention up here. Here you can see it's going to initialize, update some textures, and here you can see Updating geometry keycap, <laughs> look at this, <laughs> it's like it has to do 31,039 keycaps. So I'm not 100% sure, but I believe this is the process of just importing all these objects into the VRAM. As you can see here on memory, it uses 10.5 gigabytes of memory. I think I had 11 gigabytes on my previous computer, so that would might have worked. But on my computer before that, this would have not been possible to render. Okay, so what's next? Let's have a look. Oh yeah, it's the van shot. Let's just have a look at this in full screen first. So this is a 400 gigabyte smoke simulation. It was made using Embergen. It was quite of a pain to make because I first had to animate the car in Blender. And here you can see there's also a drone, which is pretty fun. <laughs> but I had to animate the car in Blender, import that to Embergen, export the VDB into Blender again, just hope it worked. So it was a lot of work, a lot of back and forth. It took quite some time. And I also had to re-render it multiple times because I wasn't happy with the level of noise. So the final render was, I think, 60 hours or something. It's a lot, but it would have been probably a week on my previous computer. And here's something really interesting I did. So since I was rendering in EXR, I always render in EXR, you should have a look at my EXR video. If you haven't watched it already, you should have a look at my EXR video. It's this one. You should always render in EXR. So since I'm rendering in EXR, there's a lot of details in the shadows and in the light that you can just bring back up again because you're rendering with basically an infinitely amount of dynamic range. So what I did for this shot, which I thought was really cool to just recreate that low quality drone effect, is just to overexpose it when we're in the shadow here. So 
it's as if the camera is trying to do exposure compensation, but then when you get to the bright part again, it gets brought down. And all of this color grading was done in DaVinci Resolve, by the way, because I was rendering in EXR. Look at how much more realistic it looks, especially when you can see the drone shadow. And then in the video, when you're watching it, the audio of the drone sort of kicks up and you can hear like this when you're passing by. Which, if you really think about it, doesn't make any sense because the the drone should be making the same amount of noise all the time, right? But in the edit, I just realized I'm gonna have to increase the noise of the drone because we see it. It's super weird. Video editing is so weird sometimes. This was animated using an add-on, which is called RBC. This one. It's a really cool add-on. I think I've tried to demo this add-on in a live stream. This one. So I'm using a controller here to control this car, which is basically something you can do in this add-on. I used this add-on to animate a van from... I used Polygonic, uh, the traffic. So if you go to spawn assets, I think it's utility vehicles. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's this one. So I did this, but I did some modifications to it. So the original backstory to this shot was that it's the world championship of how thick smoke can you create. So it's like this fenced in area. You can see there's fencing around it. So yeah, I tried to make some backstory to this. I'm not sure if that helped with the realism. But for me, this feels like perhaps one of the most realistic shots. Although there's something with the smoke that I can't really put my finger on. It might be not enough details. And perhaps it should also color the ground a little bit more. Because it's such a vibrant color of the smoke, it should have been affecting the ground a little bit more. Yeah, we can actually open up an Embergen first. So what I did is that I animated it using the RBC add-on in Blender. And then I exported that from Blender as an FBX, I think, into Embergen. Here you can see the smoke is coming out. I've turned down the resolution a little bit now, so it's a little bit more smooth. But yeah, this is essentially the, the process. You just make an object in Embergen, you say, hey, you're going to make some smoke. And then what I basically tweaked the most for this... Oh, look at how cool this looks. Look at that. This twisting effect of the smoke, that's the effect I really wanted to try and focus on. The settings that I tweaked the most, I think, was how long the smoke is going to stay in the air. Because there's not that much wind here. So it was like, if it dissipated too quickly, it just looked like it was nothing. And if it dissipated too slowly, it just smoked everywhere. But I think I found like a nice middle ground. Then I exported this to Blender, which ended up being a 400 gigabyte smoke simulation. So that means that I don't think I have the smoke simulation in this scene. But you can see the material here. This is how simple the smoke shader is. So you can screenshot this if you like. This is the smoke material. Oh, and by the way, inside of this, I forgot about this. There is this Mixamo model. There's an IK armature in here. So, this bone is parented to this wheel. And then this wheel is sort of moving around. Look at that. Look at how extremely realistic that looks like. I just tried to set this up like a meme, but it actually turned out really well. Look at this. It looks like this guy is turning. So then I just animated this to make it look like he's actually turning. So when the wheels turn, he has a keyframe. And you can't really see it in the car, but something really cool that happens at the end of the animation. So he stops the car, he sort of, he parks the car like this, and now look at this. Look, it looks like he's gearing, right? He's like, he's putting on a handbrake or something. Look at that. Like, a little bit. <laughs> and that was just a glitch, and I'm super happy about it. And I think you can actually see it in the final video, so let's see. Yeah, look at that. You got a little bit of an, uh, like, a, some, he's like adjusting. That's like life, you know? It's like a real person reacting to something. It felt like, at least. And one more thing I need to talk about is this thing. It's a cloth simulation. So this object, as you can see here, this cube thing, this is the simulation. So this spring has a surface deform pointing at this cloth simulation. And the cloth simulation has a stiffness, which is a weight paint. You see this? Fully heavy hair, and then it's not heavy at all hair. It's like an inflatable arm thing. The trick is to hide this object. So you can see this object is not visible in the render, it's only the spring. So you just have to simulate this low poly cube thing instead of this entire spring, which just saves a lot of time. And it's a little bit more reliable as well. Now, for the final trick of this shot, the drone. So there's a shadow of a drone in this shot. So I just really thought about this how can I make this as realistic as possible? And I just tried to think, how was this made, you know? And I realized, of course, there's gonna be a drone that is filming this, so we have to make the drone. There is a camera in the scene, and then there is a drone that is parented to the camera. But the problem is, look at that. Look at this. You can't have it like this. 
because now you can see the drone, right? So the drone is hidden. So in the ray visibility, the drone is hidden from the camera. Here you can see there's just a, I just modeled a really rough uh, DJI drone. And you also got the propellers. I'm gonna select all of them and just enable them in the camera as well. It's just this really subtle gradient. And then this drone is also animated a little bit. So when the camera is changing angle, the drone is rotating as well. See this? Yeah, so you can see this even better in the rendered video. Yeah, here the drone, and it sort of tilts, and it moves the other way. However, the biggest problem with this shot now is that wouldn't the drone, like, push all the smoke away below it, and you would make, like, a super interesting whirly pattern, and it would really mess things up? Probably. I, uh... I didn't do that. Because first I did a 400 gigabyte smoke simulation, which took like many hours to export as a VDB, even with Embergen, which is fast. And then I was like, okay, so I have this smoke simulation and now I've added this drone and I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rebake the simulation. <laughs> so yeah, but I'm not sure if anyone is noticing that. So it's gonna be interesting to see in the comments if people are thinking that the drone should be pushing away the smoke. Because honestly, the biggest problem with the smoke is that the car or the van is actually not pushing away the smoke, it's just deleting the smoke. There was a bug with the animated collision in Embergen, so it would just mess up the smoke if I tried to use the vehicle as an animated collision. So I just basically turned it into a smoke deleter. So it's basically, it's moving into the smoke and it's just chopping away all the smoke without pushing it away. So that's probably the most unrealistic part about this smoke simulation, especially over here. Here you can see, it. this would have definitely pushed away the smoke a bit more, but I think the the twisting effect we get here. Look at that. The ch -ch 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 -ch. Yeah, that's so cool. Okay, so the next shot is the flower. So this effect is mostly just shaders. I think actually everything that's happening except for the camera movement are shaders. This is probably going to be really difficult to preview in the blend file, so, but let's try anyways. So here you can see in the shot, you're starting out with a rose and you end up with a rose. So this is all shaders, which is uh, gonna be really difficult to preview because these shaders required 128 light bounces. So let me go into render view here and see. In the world, you can see it's still using the sky texture set to Nishita. So this rose is a glass rose, which has a bump texture set to magic texture. Also, fun fact about the magic texture, Ton Rosendahl, the man who made Blender, he also made this texture. How cool is that? Anyways, I used this texture. Like I wanted to make it look like some, like not completely organic, but just a little bit, almost as if it was made in a factory, like plastic or just some repetitive technique to make these petals. Here you can see this, it's just an object that I call gradient controller. And when you move this up and down, it will animate. So this was set up by using color ramps to sort of tweak the um, edge and then use a gradient texture on top of that. So instead of trying to explain this with words, let me just show you how this works because it's actually not that advanced. So I can do this. Yeah, if I just move this up, you can see that there's a gradient here that is just animated. And then instead of having this be a completely flat gradient like this. So this is the basic gradient. And then I'm using a color ramp, which makes it a little bit smoother. And then it is a Voronoi texture, which looks like this. And this isn't really affected by this. But the point of the Voronoi texture is to change the edge. So imagine that you want this edge to be a little bit broken up. Then this Voronoi texture has been added. So now if you look at the combination of this, it is a little bit more organic. And what this controls is a transparent material. So now we're viewing the transparent material. Now when you're watching the final result, you got this really beautiful interaction with glass and transparent. So the color ramp shader that I just showed you is chopping away a really realistic default glass shader because Blender's default glass shader is amazing. So now you can see it's getting animated. So now you can probably understand a little bit more that it's just growing because there's this texture and there's just this gradient that is being moved upwards. And then there's this camera motion that sort of pulls back and makes it look like it's growing towards the camera a little bit, I guess. And then this light, that is basically just another part of this glass material. Yeah, here you can see you have only the glass shader without any light. And here you can see you have the emission. These flowers are evolving at the same 
sort of way. So this is also another texture that is being animated using a similar technique. And then this initial explosion, like the expansion like that, this one is a little bit more fancy with the color ramps, but this one works a little bit similar that you have an object that you're animating. This one, yeah, it's a ripple controller. So this one is being scaled up and down. See that? If I were to do this again, I would have probably tried to do it not with a shader, but with geometry and maybe geometry nodes, even though I don't know how to use geometry nodes. So everyone who's using geometry nodes is probably sitting here thinking, you should have done this with geometry and not shaders. Because with shaders, you get a slower result because of the transparent shader that needs so many light paths bounces. But the uh, RTX 4090 was able to do this just fine. Speaking of long render times, let's have a look at the longest render I've ever done. And by longest, I mean the most render heavy. And this shot took, I think it was 3.7 days to render. And the reason why it's taking so long is because you can see these highlights in the leaves here. They don't really show up until sample 250. It's like, it's just noise before that. So this was rendered at 4096 samples, I think, and a really low noise threshold. Look at these god rays here. I'm really happy about that. And almost all the lighting here is the Nitisha sky texture. I just increased the power of the sun in the palm of my hand. And then this glass object in the center here is a curve upon a curve that is moving along a curve. It's just curves. I'm just gonna show you how to make this. It's quite fun. And the vegetation here is from Botanic as well. So let's have a look at this last project file. So just to show you how slow this is to render, let me just put this into render view. And here you can see it looks, you know, it looks might look like a regular scene, but if you're watching this through the camera view and you're just letting this load, look at this, we're at frame and we're at 16 samples, 20 samples. You can still not see any details in the leaves here, right? But once we're getting towards 100 samples, 120, look at this. Now you can see these details here and here in the grass as well. So this render just required a lot of rendering power. It was really fun to do. I was so excited when I was waking up on the fourth day <laughs> to watch this. Anyways, let's have a look at how this curve object is made. Let me open up a new file and just show you quickly how you can set this up. So you use a curve and let's just um, make some more uh, stuff here and just press A to select everything, V automatic. So now here's just a curve path, right? So now let's make another curve and let's make this flat. And in the object data properties, if I increase the geometry and then I use a curve modifier on the curve and set it to be the curve. Now you can move this curve along the curve and it will bend like a curve. So there's a lot of curves here. Now let's scale this up and let's add some more subdivisions. Now I didn't really make an interesting shape like the other one, but the point is when you're moving this curve around, it's interesting, but this is just like a cylinder, right? Instead of having this curve just be a round bevel, you can set the bevel of the curve to be another curve. So let's make another curve, a third one, and let's just delete this and go shift space and draw and just make this really detailed shape and you can press Alt C so now it's a loop and then press V automatic. I'm gonna move this down. So now you can take the curve, this one, and you can set it to be this. Let's scale this down. And now you can see where I'm going with this. And then you can duplicate this curve and you can duplicate this one. You can make it bigger and you can set this to be the bigger one. So now you have like two curves on top of each other. This one is shorter, right? So now this curve is moving on top of that curve. So now you can get, now you get this one that's moving around, right? It's basically just curves upon curves upon curves. And what's really cool about this technique that is amazing is that you can always change the resolution of all the curves. So in wireframe view, look at all this mesh, right? It's way too much. But if you just lower this one and this one and this one, you can just lower the resolution preview of all the curves, and then you have a super lightweight animation. And then in the final render, you can just increase this to something really high and it will look really good. Now, instead of increasing this render resolution, I just used a subdivision surface modifier. So that's, uh, that's basically just the same thing. So this is a really cool way to just create some abstract geometry using only curves. And uh, let's have a look at one more thing here. There is volumetrics here, but there's something interesting about this volumetrics. Yeah, here you can see the volumetrics. Let me show you the gradient texture. 
Look at this, there is a texture that is a gradient. So it's very dense down here and it's not so dense up here. I'm using a color ramp to basically make it a little bit smoother. So here you got not so dense volumetrics up here and it's a lot more denser down here. And this just makes it look like the sky is more clear while the streaks in the sun, the god rays here, are more visible towards the ground. So this was, it took quite a while to dial in since volumetrics is really slow to render. But I just think it's a really cool effect that you get to have this varying degree of volumetrics. And then I think the only light source in this scene, the world shader with the sky texture just set to a really high brightness. It has a sun intensity of three and a strength of 0.1. And then you can sort of, you can rotate this if you like, and you will get a completely different look. Yeah, that's, oh, that's interesting. It's like a sunset, but I really like it when it's coming from over there. I think it, it feels a little bit magical. I'm, I'm so happy about this shot. I'm definitely going to try and make some more longer renders in the future because it was really fun to just do a, like a three day render. I do actually have an overview of all the render times. So this one, the explosion took 17 hours to render. The golf shot took 19 hours. So this is the space blanket. And then this is the golf hit. And then the smoke dude, 5.6 hours. So as you can see here, the total render time of this entire project was 301 hours, which is insane. This would have taken way over a thousand hours to render on my previous computer. So that is my art film project. It was a really fun project to do. It is 0.3% uh, of my life that I will never get back, but it was worth it. I haven't really used anything other than Blender for many, many years now. So it was interesting to use Embergen. It was also interesting to use some paid add-ons, for example, Botanic and the car controlling add-on. I just learned so much about myself. And one really interesting thing that I learned is that the grass is always greener on the other side. You might think to yourself, oh my God, I wish I just had like a month where I can just make whatever I want. Let me tell you, like on day five, it was like super painful. I just had to force myself to do stuff, to, to create something out of nothing, you know? It's, it's a friction there. It's really difficult. So if you're curious about that journey, I did actually make three devlogs on Patreon, so you can watch those and see how I struggled throughout this process. So if you ended up watching this entire video, that's pretty cool. I, this is probably a much longer video than I thought it would be, but I had a lot of fun with this project and it was also quite fun to just sort of go through the final scenes with you and just uh, talk about it. So let me know if you have any questions. Big thanks to NVIDIA for sponsoring this video and hooking me up with an amazing new computer, the RTX 4090. You should um, check out their links in the description. They have some pretty cool hardware. It's also really cool that they sort of trusted that I would do this project because I just asked them, can you help me out? And they did, so that's amazing. So now I think I'm gonna get back to making some interesting tutorials again. And uh, I'm very excited about that. Thanks for watching.